Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and we're grateful that you gave us an hour of your time to better understand the intersection of sexuality, where it meets at the intersection of LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. It's podca pa podcast episodes just like this that help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. If you wanna help us uh, better share messages just like this, we invite you to like and comment below if you're watching on the video version of this podcast episode on Facebook or YouTube. And if you are catching us on an audio version wherever you catch your favorite podcasts, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. Today's podcast episode is unique in that we feature a couple story and often we have parents and people reaching out saying, where are the couple stories? Where are the stories of hope and, and example when it comes to happy and thriving and healthy relationships? Well, we hope to do that today to at least give you an opportunity to see uh, what, what same-sex relationships looks like, uh, look like, uh, same-gender relationships um, as they exist um, in or out of religious tradition. So that's something that we want to focus on today. So without further ado, we want to welcome to the podcast, Cole Rasmussen and Kent Curlo. Hey, hey. Welcome, welcome. Now, not only are we discussing relationships, but this is like a repeat. We've had you on previous episodes. Each of you shared your stories, um, which I think were really fascinating because we, we were able to take the podcast and dive into completely different aspects of your stories and, and how they relate to, um, getting to you getting to where you're at today which is probably why I think the repeat, the round two, was really important. Um, you each have unique and special s individual stories that have now combined into a relationship. So thanks for coming back again. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, maybe let's start, for those who didn't catch your previous episodes, um, give us just a quick background about who each of you are, just a quick view of your story, and then we can jump in. Cole, do you want to go first? Sure, you bet. Uh, my name is Cole Rasmussen. I grew up in um, the Spanish Fork area in Utah County here in Utah. Or in Utah, we currently actually are in Southern Utah, or, or Kent and I currently live right now in St. George. So, uh, but yep, grew up there. <clears throat> I am currently 36. I work actually in healthcare. I work for a, a hospital that's in Utah County, but specifically live in Southern Utah to help refer and transfer patients to other facility that I work for in Provo and help do some marketing and and uh, clinical work down here. So it's fun. And you um, you officially kind of came out at what age? You know, I came out at what I feel like is compared to today much later than some than most people. I was 29 by the time I officially told my parents that I was gay. Um, but I probably more and less started acting on it more and starting really accepting myself 27, 28, leading up to being 29, where then I was like, you know what, I, I want to be authentic, I want to be true, and I feel like I accepted myself and accepted this process and knew that my life was going to be okay, that like I was going to be happy, and that I had the ability to choose my happiness. But part of that was involving my family and actually getting to tell them how I identified and why that was significant. So I was 29 when I told them. Well, at any rate, if the quote was actually true and could be attributed, Brigham Young would indeed say you were a menace to society. I, I was a long, unfortunate menace. Way past the age of prime. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably why, since I couldn't find a girl to, to take care of anything, that I might as well then just be gay, right? There, yeah, I mean, it's obviously the default. Interestingly, you bring that up, and this is a complete side note, but apparently in 1897, George Q. Cannon said polygamy was the reason for... Uh, the cure for homosexuality that as a man got bored with his single wife he could take another wife oh. so he wouldn't turn to seeking other men for a, to make up other for the relationship forms of intimacy oh, he was wow. lacking i'm like <laughs> that couldn't be further from my experience yeah, yeah that's that gets dark a little <laughs> one bit. woman wasn't enough <laughs> we'll bring on another one so you don't turn to men exactly like, exactly wow interesting <laughs> yeah interesting I need, side note i definitely need to jump into that a little because i that would be interesting to dissect George yeah. P. Cannon's brain to figure out what was causing that. Gosh. And how many case studies the church had at that point. To, to exactly. Yeah. And this was what, what year? 1897. 1897. Wow. Turn of the century. So, yeah, clearly 50 years after coming into Utah, it did something to the saints. Like, yeah. For sure. Interestingly enough. Kent, welcome again. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I grew up in Boise, Idaho, for the most part. Um, served a mission in Phoenix. Studied at BYU-Hawaii and currently work in marketing, um, work remotely 
here in St. George where we live, as Cole said. And uh, I came out around the same time Cole did. So I had been married for about three and a half years to a woman um, and uh, at length divorced and uh, started dating a little while after, after that divorce, uh, but came out um, pretty close to 30. So again, the purpose of a podcast episode like this is just to kind of highlight what a relationship looks like and what takes us, what gets each of your individual lives to a point where you're ready to date. We've had a, we've actually had a decent, nice, uh, long engagement that I also feel like the pandemic of 2020 played into because I think I significantly, I wanted a party to get to have like a chance to be able to really celebrate what I do feel like is um, a really fortunate situation given everything I think we've each been through and been there for each other. And so I felt like I don't want to limit uh, how many people could come to our wedding. Nonetheless, uh, also it felt really appropriate because Kent and I agreed through this whole process. Anyways, not to jump the gun, but I also, Kent and I have now been dating for about three and a half years from the time that we first met. And we've been engaged for, I guess we got engaged uh, September, August of 2020. And uh, anyways, and we dated for a good amount of time before we also chose to move and live together. And then... Of course, when I got this job, Kent agreed to come with me, which is a big sigh of relief. Uh, so we have actually, and we lived in St. George now for actually just about just over a year. So we're kind of newer to this area. We unfortunately moved here and then with due to the pandemic, everything kind of shut down. So we still feel like we haven't really got to connect with the area in which we'd really had hoped. But yeah. Let's talk about the time that Harry met Sally. <laughs> How did you two meet? Yeah, so it, I had just started volunteering uh, with a nonprofit, uh, you know, in, in Utah County, in Circle, and I was a volunteer there, and I had just come out, so I was, you know, months <clears throat> out of the closet, but looking for a, a soft place to land, and uh, found some great community there, and um, just really good people who, to this day, are, are still dear friends. So, as a volunteer, um, Paul and Susie Augenstein, who were also volunteers at the time, uh, held just kind of a, a casual volunteer social to get people together in their backyard. So I went, I was living really close by <laughs> to where they were holding the event at the time and thought, you know, this could be good for me to engage and, you know, being newly out, this is, this is a good safe space where I can just engage with other volunteers and people who are going to understand kind of where I'm coming from. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm relatively introverted, so it seemed to present a good opportunity to kind of safely navigate a new community. So I went there and uh, short of it is uh, I was hanging out for a bit and Cole also came. And I remember pretty clearly Cole kind of walking up to the table of people where I was sitting and kind of introducing himself and kind of just taking, you know, charismatic command of the conversation and asking questions of people there. And um, I just remember thinking like, oh, this guy's like really at ease with himself and is very good at engaging people and just seemed very kind and like interested and genuine and you know we chatted for a little bit and then i i left shortly after and i think saw him on the way out you know thanked susie for hosting and just you know left and uh it was maybe a month or so later paul and susie started a game night in their home um just for lgbtq people to come and socialize and uh cole and i were both added along with many others to to that group on Facebook for just, you know, hanging out and playing games. And uh, he sent me a friend request, I think, once we both ended up in that group and we started sort of chatting there on Facebook. Do I get to say my studies? Yeah. yeah. I wanna... <laughs> because you're not charismatic, you didn't show up. Oh, at the exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That's, that's all a lie fabricated. No, uh, I had, I guess at this point, I had actually probably already been out for three to four years. And I had dated and such, but... Prior to this, I remember I was an EFY counselor and did get a chance to work for EFY for five summers and really enjoyed it. And uh, in my other podcast that I had with you, I did get to share about how every year I think I kept re-signing up to be a counselor again because I kept thinking, okay, I'm going to finally meet that girl. I'm going to finally meet that girl. And uh, which is very funny that this, anyways, led to me meeting a boy, I guess. But anyways, I remember distinctly uh, one of the girls that I just was so fascinated with, I admired. She was talented, a return missionary, beautiful brunette, gorgeous girl. And I just remember thinking, oh, she's so pretty. I, I just wish, and we were already kind of friends. And I just kept thinking, oh, I just wish we could date. And Adam like trying to date. And short, or our, I remember our last date was the last time 
Imagine Dragons played at the Velour in Provo. And uh, that night her car got towed and it just was, it was just a terrible date. It was, the concert was great, but it was terrible. Long story short, a couple years later, I joined the Affirmation Group. And this individual woman is in the Affirmation Group and she had just posted, hey everybody, I just sent a letter to my parents letting them know that I'm gay. I would really appreciate if people would help me, you know, or think of me or, you know, pray for me. And I just remember being like, what? That this woman, this girl that was like everything I ever aspired and adamantly tried to date is also gay? And uh, that and besides now, I've, many of my fellow EFI counselors, we've run into each other and, and gay bars and such, but that's a different story for another day. <laughs> um, anyways, but she and I, for the first time, actually got to authentically become very close friends and actually finally tell our whole stories to each other and became very close and happy to report that through me getting to connect again with her, she met or she was dating this beautiful girl at the time and they had gotten married and I got to be one of her groomsmen in their wedding and enjoy this beautiful day with them. And we have stayed since then very close. They had been selected to be table captains at the HRC fundraiser that happens yearly at uh, the uh, Little American Hotel in Salt Lake. And so she reached out, she says, Cole, you've got to come, come to the, have you never been to an HRC fundraiser? It's a great chance to meet people. And I, at the point was like, you know what? I really want to go. I want to meet more people. I want to put myself out there. I'm sitting there at the table and this was June of 2017. And that is the year uh, Encircle had just opened up in Provo. Barbara, or Barb Young and Steve Young had given an award to Stephanie Larson uh, for this new project that they created called Encircle and for the outreach in which it had done. And a friend at our table turns to this girl and I, and she goes, and he said, this is like gay EFY, you have to go get involved. And we both looked at each other, we're like, we gotta check this out. And it was that same friend that said, hey, there's this event happening in Riverton in the south, uh, southern part of Salt Lake County, you need to go, or that's an Encircle gathering of this family that they're just putting on, you ought to go and just go meet people and get involved with Encircle. And so I showed up to this barbecue and met this other family that have now today play a huge role in our life, uh, the Augensteins, who I think you've also had a chance to interview before, and have done a lot of work for a lot of the people in the community between Salt Lake and Utah County. And anyways, I, and I remember, like, I confess that I do know that I talk to a lot of people. <laughs> and so, but I do remember this, like, really attractive, dark-haired, dark-eyed, cute boy at the table. And I remember probably, unfortunately, more significantly standing in the hallway as he came to say goodbye to Susie, uh, as she and I were talking in the hallway, and then he's like, I gotta leave. And I remember as he walked away, I was like, oh, that is a very attractive male. <laughs> and uh, anyways, and so, yes, then she started this Facebook group, put us in the Facebook group, and I probably was, I don't wanna confess this, but was totally scouting out who were the cute people in the group, saw this really acute, attractive, beautiful smile, dark eyes. <laughs> Uh, guy and I'm like oh but then to the end of my mind I'm like watch wow, he's probably not even gay and he was just a nice person happy to be there but of course and unfortunately to the gay culture it was like well he's cute and we have common friends friend request sent and then I don't hear anything from him for like two months or a month and a half and then sure enough all of a sudden I get this message one day that's like oh hey I'm so sorry I, I got a friend request from you and thanks for sending me a friend request and I was like, cute boy is talking to me. <laughs> so I was like, I gotta respond back. And so I messaged him back and it, and after like a couple passes back and forth, I was like, hey, would you like to go grab lunch sometime? And it ended up being that he was gonna be leaving town, but the only time that he had available was the next day. So if I remember right, I think October 2nd of 2017 was our first date and we went to a little restaurant there in Lehigh. And I showed up with, I think especially because I, I had comfortably dated, I was comfortable with myself, had a lot of great friends and, uh, probably even more comfortable kind of outside of the settings of the LDS culture. But I don't know, something about Kent caught my eye and I was like, I'm like, huh, sat down besides the fact that I thought he was cute and attractive. I was just like, we just chatted. And all of a sudden, I think our first date, three and a half hours just went by. And we just sat there and just talked kind of about everything and anything. I knew really quickly that Kent had, you know, recently been divorced only I think about a year at that point and was kind of, starting to explore and he can talk more about that. But I was like, I just know that this is a good person and he's kind. And I was like, I just want to be his friend. <laughs> the things you kind of say to yourself in the beginning. Anyways.
So at that point, we just kind of started to be friends and just kind of started to hang out when we had some chance and asked him out. And he said yes. And until he gave me a good enough reason not to ask him out, I was going to keep asking him out. Yeah. And it worked. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, Ken, do you remember the story the same way Cole tells uh, it? I mean, yeah, that's really how it played out. And I think it, by way of, I guess, advancing the, the story, I was in a place where I was still trying to figure out if I was ready to date, if I wanted to date. And dating can be hard. Like, in a gay community, I expect anywhere. And I'm a very conscientious and often introverted person. So I, I am, too. Yeah. <laughs> very, very introverted. So, like, it, you know, I made missteps and I felt guilty and, and terrible about those missteps or like spending time with someone or, you know, in an unintentionally misleading someone when I, you know, thought I was building a friendship but was misperceived or, and that happened both ways. And, you know, I, I made mistakes that I, you know, feel terrible about. But I think <clears throat> we all make them as we're, figuring out <laughs> yeah, not just our like identity, but just dating in, in general. And most people I think get to make those mistakes in their youth when they're dating people who they actually want to date. Um, I was dating, you know, at that point who I, I thought was best for me at the time, but it's a different experience before you come out and you're, you're trying to date and do your best. But um, it's almost like second adolescence. I've heard it called, um, you know, I was 30 at the time and really dating for the first time authentically. And so, you know, you make mistakes and missteps and you're, you're reading and trying to understand yourself and other people who have walked a really similar path. And so it's, I try to give myself and everyone involved grace because it's just, it can be tough. Like so many of us as adult, like men, <laughs> like in the church or slightly out of the church or somewhere in between, it's, you're navigating a lot. And so I was very reticent to a large degree to jump into anything. Um, but in meeting Cole, I, I thought, okay, like I can start going on dates and try to be upfront and just like, hey, this is where I'm at. And I, this is new for me. And I am navigating this um, kind of unfamiliar territory. And essentially in, in that experimentation and trying to get to know myself and others, I was going on a lot of dates and trying to say yes to, to opportunities and engage and if nothing else, make new friends in a new community. And, uh, you know, inadvertently found myself overwhelmed, um, found myself, uh, you know, being attacked in ways for misleading, you know, people who I was trying to build at least a friendship with. And, you know, I felt terrible about that, honestly. Um, but Cole was there for that chapter of my life where I was trying to kind of safely and genuinely date <laughs> and, and do that in the healthiest way I knew how. And uh, I remember, you know, feeling overwhelmed to the degree that I just thought, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I shouldn't have done this. It was a mistake. I, I'm hurting people I never wanted to hurt. I, you know, I'm clearly not communicating as effectively as I thought. And I need to just not do this but now, possibly ever again. And a lot of that kind of came to a head, um, you know, at, at one point and, um, Cole sort of stepped up in that moment. And I just remember I, I was heartbroken and hurt. I felt guilt that I had unintentionally hurt someone else. And I remember just thinking, I must owe Cole an apology as well. If someone else, expressed, you know, frustration and anger with me for how I treated them, I expect Cole must feel the same way because I, you know, was kind of telling Cole this thing. Can you be and a little bit more specific on, on expressing the fact because you were spending time with, with some people and making friendships. And from my perspective, I will even add that I remember very much uh, like on our third or fourth date, I think I had just spoke up and said, hey, I feel like I want to let you know that I'm attracted to you, that I haven't really enjoyed spending time with you. And I was like, I would like to know if we can continue doing this. And Kent in all his transparency and honesty was like, that's fine, but I'm just starting to kind of date guys and really explore this. There are other guys I'm dating. And I was like, you should, <laughs> you should date other people. You should get to know. 
But unless you're telling me you don't want to spend time with me, I'm just letting you know I want to spend time with you that I'm enjoying this. And unless you're like, hey, Cole, I just really don't feel the same way, I just want to, you know, I'm, I'm interested. And he was very transparent at that time to even be like, okay, I'm still going to dating with people, so I'm not trying to make any commitment. But I, and I guess you didn't have any reason to say you didn't want to date me at that time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and in hindsight, I mean, even hearing you say it, my skin crawls because I'm just like, oh my gosh, am I a sociopath? <laughs> like, <laughs> but you know no, what I mean? and I think like... from my perspective, because I did have a couple years of openly dating before Kent, where I was like, <laughs> no, you should. And I do think that in our culture, there is appropriate, there should be more appropriate space to understand more of like what is authentic, authentic, authentic. And I think we we talk about sometimes too, and specifically in gay culture, and coming from a very uh, normal, strict uh, society to then all of a sudden feeling the expression of freedom that you hear this term of the pendulum swing. And I kind of feel like if that indeed is going to happen, it typically then gets to like find that middle, middle ground. And everybody should get to kind of have that variant to figure out like what really feels good. And this is maybe off the topic and we can go more into a little bit later on, but within the gay culture and that spectrum, there's everything as far as like what fantasy and interests and and things that you find, and I kind of feel like I would be one who would speak up by saying that should be a spectrum to understand and not be afraid of it. But like, so I was like, no, like Kent, unless you tell me you really don't want to or not feeling anything, I'm just being vulnerable by saying, I really enjoy our time together, but I would even encourage you to keep dating other people. Now, I understand, and especially for Kent, the idea of still going on multiple dates with the same people and kind of really getting the chance to ask himself, Huh, well, we went to a movie and it was nice, or we got to have good conversations and it was nice, and I don't, like, unless he's being forced to choose, if you're not really ready to choose, I was like, I'm fine, I'm just expressing my interest. You should get to know what feels good. But in that, though, even if it was just spending time with some of the same people, it meant more to some of those people than it might have done to you. And when they found out that he was still dating other people, kind of called you out in a way that made you feel like you were misleading to people. Would, that, would you say that's incorrect? Yeah, it just, you know, unintentional, but rookie mistake or however you want to, you know, spell that out. And I guess it's important to just, the dialogue around gay dating and maybe it's specific to Utah, I, I expect not, but it's, it is a small circle and it's, you never want to make enemies. I never want to make enemies and that, you know, that was never my intention. And I think in the best case scenario, you date and you form really significant friendships, if nothing else. And like, that's the hope, right? Is, hey, we tried something more romantic and weren't feeling it, but, you know, I have you as a friend and an ally now and in, in this kind of small community. So it, that was something I was navigating. And, you know, when that sort of like became hard and, and painful for me and I felt like I was doing more harm than good, Cole kind of just showed up in that moment and was like, Kent, I'm here as a friend and I want you to know that I, I expect to understand what you're feeling right now and I, I think you probably feel some guilt and you've, you know, maybe caused some pain and however that looks for you, I just want you to know I'm here as a friend and you, you know, can take time to figure this out. You don't owe me anything and just kind of walked me through it. It was a, a tough, you know, moment. And uh, at that point, he's like, you know, if you ever would be interested in dating again, I'm going to leave that to you. You know, you can circle back. He said, I may or may not be like waiting for you, but like if you feel like you're ready to circle back and we can try dating again, like let me know. And if, if that works out, great. And if not, you'll still have a friend. And I was like, man, this is really everything I'd hoped for in dating is to not make enemies, but like at least end up with a friend. So that was right around, you know, the holidays right, and, right around Thanksgiving and so I, had, shortly after. I went home for Christmas, you know, shortly after this and saw my family in Idaho and was working through a lot of it with them and, you know, took it to my board of six sisters, <laughs> the, uh, the board, and was kind of walking them through this and they're like, Kent Cole sounds like he really understands you. And if nothing else, is just a good person who like understands people and is empathetic and is someone who like knows how to like show up. And like as I'm walk, you know, talking through it myself and they're kind of giving me feedback, I was just like, yeah, Cole really, really did, I think, the best thing 
he could have for me in that moment. And by the time I came home from Christmas, you know, and it's near New Year's, uh, Cole reached out and was like, hey, as a friend, no strings attached, do you want to just join me and a few other friends at this New Year's Eve party, you know, that my office is holding? And I was like, you know what, I'd really like that. Because I knew I wanted to, t- like, touch base with him, you know, having thought through a few things. And uh, to paraphrase, I Oh, no, I, I jo- tell a story? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> So I was fairly new working for a company. And uh, all that I know is that I get called into the office and they're like, uh, you were invited to the New Year's Eve party at our boss's house. And all that I know is that in the short time that I'd worked there, I've heard stories about how grand and significant this house is. <laughs> Anyways, and I won't go into too many details, but I called a couple of my friends and I'm like, yo, I have no idea what it's gonna be like, but I'm technically allowed a plus one. I'm gonna bring plus three and let's go check out this house and then we can go do whatever we want in Salt Lake once the, the house is or once it's open, or over. And I remember that year too, New Year's Eve fell on a Sunday. So it was like a weird date because like it's a Sunday. So like half of everything's closed. There's really not much going on. But anyway, so I reached out to Ken. I'm like, hey, some friends and I, I've invited some friends to come to this work party with me. Would you like to go or do you have any plans right now for New Year's Eve? And I also felt like I specifically invited a couple of my other gay friends And for me, and maybe just to go back to, because another very important point or something that I think served me really well in dating is, and I think that is the the hardest and one of the most critical aspects of gay culture and specifically coming away from like gay Mormons, when you are in a space where you start to allow yourself to date, the idea, because you need masculine feminine friends, but I also feel like you still need masculine friends besides people who you are now dating. And I do think that there is a level of immaturity when it comes to dating um, authentically for the first time, however that looks for you individually, right? If gay, lesbian, transgender, so-and-so. I feel like that you're now figuring out, as Kent mentioned, instead of an adolescent sending a note of like, check yes or no if you want to meet under the bleachers, it's now like, uh, I, and so I really is that second adolescence where I feel like there's a lot of immaturity to kind of now figure out because you're actually dating authentically now for the first time. And the emotions, <clears throat> you've compressed these emotions and I think that they have the ability to come out in various forms and in various ways that is sometimes very detrimental and I think especially on the emotional level because you're no longer just a 13 year old kid he's figuring this out at the awkward stage of junior high when you're also getting BO and learning how to use deodorant you're figuring this out in your 20s and you are now a full capable person an adult and I think that that emotion now and like letting it out of the box can represent also too, I think, a lot of the extremes. Anyways, and so for me, trying to be a friend to Kent and observing his situation, and, and again, I'm not one who believes I know everything, but I was like, ah, oh, if I was Kent, this is what I feel like I would need. I need good friends besides just knowing who I can date and who I can't. So I like staged this out and was like, okay, I'm gonna invite Kent. He's gonna meet a couple of my other gay friends and we're just gonna all be friends. We're just gonna go together. He says he'd like to go. New Year's Eve, I'm like vacuuming and first friend's like, oh, hey, something came up. I can't come. I got to go with my family. Next friend, like an hour later, is like, hey, Cole, are you going to be bad and bad if I, if I bail? Something's going to come up. And I'm like, no, we, I can't be on a date. This is, this is Ken. Like, we're only friends. Like, we can't engage. Like, I, I have to have a third person. So when my friends bailed, I am like literally messaging everybody, like trying to find a third person who will be a will, a third will, so that this would not look like a date because we're just supposed to be friends anyways but of course by like six o'clock the day of new year's eve everybody has plans you know what you're gonna do that night i couldn't find anybody so i like i don't know i think i text you and i was like uh so can my friends kind of build do you have like anybody else like one of your six sisters <laughs> i don't know they all were actually out of state but i was like anybody else that you want to invite on the to come with us tonight and he's like ah uh, you know i don't think so but i'm happy if it's just the two of us and I was like, wait, just the two of us. What does that mean? We can make it if we try. Oh, <laughs> you would think, right? And I remember being like, and I'm just like back I'm like, what does that mean? He's okay if it's just the two of us. And I'm like playing out in my head because I'm like, we just kind of had this big talk like less than a month ago. And I like, I've established the friend rule. Like we are friends. And, I, and I'm like, and you, you can't break the friendship rule. And I, you know, and I'm like, and I'm like just worried about it. So I pull up to his house and I pick him up and he looked amazing. He like had this cute blazer on, like, clearly very business appropriate like for a business party and like the whole night i'm like hands in pockets arms folded i'm not going to touch him i'm not going to do anything like i'm not opening up his door i'm not trying to be a gentleman 
And Kent, like the whole night, amazing. Gets along with everybody. Like he hits every joke with my boss. Like everything <laughs> in being like a salesperson. I'm like, oh, you were the perfect date. But I'm like, this is not a date. We're friends. Anyways, but the one thing this party had besides a beautiful house was terrible food. <laughs> And there was just like all these little little hors d'oeuvres with nothing of substance. And Kent and I were starving. So finally, just prior to midnight, Kent's like, hey, we can just go back to my place. Like, let's go get a pizza. We're trying to go get food. We decide to leave. The only thing we can find is a Domino's pizza. So then I remember we get the Domino's pizza after waiting, get back to his place. And right as we're walking in the doors, all of a sudden pots and everything screams. And I was like, oh, happy New Year's. But I'm just like fist bump because as bad as I feel like I would lo have loved a New Year's kiss, we're friends and I'm not going to break that rule. <laughs> anyway, so we go inside after the fist bump from friends for New Year's Eve, eating the pizza and we're kind of just talking. And now I feel like I should pass the ball back to you. <laughs> and you can say what you did that night. Yeah. And so by that point, <clears throat> when I got invited to this party, I thought I'm ready to like circle back with Cole. And so I would w welcomed the opportunity to have a minute where I could like chat with him again. And so I go back to my house, it, you know, it strikes 12 and I just struck up the conversation of, you know what, like I want to circle back and this is how I'd want to do that. Like, but in my mind, I just thought I'll present this to Cole now. And then hopefully in like two or three months we can, you know, I'll see how he feels about it. And, but I want to, I'll put it out there and, and see how it goes. And so I just told him, I was like, you know, you said if I wanted to date again, I should mention it. And, you know, I'd love to try to open that door. And I said, I want to, I want to just date intentionally and, and not worry about trying to <laughs> go on other dates or, you know, manage. try to manage other people's feelings mm -hmm. at the same time. Like I'd love to just intentionally and specifically exclusively date you and see how it goes. And so I just let, you know, said, give that some thought like we can hang out if you want to in groups in the meantime or whatever short answer i got my new year's eve kiss I <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so and i was like oh absolutely and he's like well you don't have to decide right now and i was like oh no i decided a long time ago i just like i'm trying to hold up this friends act because it but it is rough see the funny thing is he said it doesn't matter like i may or may not wait for you but if you would have seen his day planner it would have said oh. waiting 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 <laughs> waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> every day of the week waiting 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 yeah. uh, so that's, that's kind of how it officially started it was yeah. you know january 1st on and, january or 2018 yeah and we were kind of inseparable from that point and I've had many re relationships been. end because I couldn't spend quality time with somebody. And if anybody studies the love languages, I will be the first one to say that quality time is hard for me because I grew up on a farm. I feel like it's about you do your act of service for somebody, you tell them they look nice, but then it's like, if you're not accomplishing something, we gotta move on, like what are we doing? Something for the first time in my life, it was just so easy to spend time together. Um, it probably helped that it was winter and Kent had a love sack, so we, watched a lot of movies. We actually even like did a fun date thing where we'd read books. Like we just picked a book and would take turns reading chapters to each other, which was, he's really good at reading. I realized I'm not, especially when I'm like nervous and trying to impress somebody, just like how I was like, oh, what's that word again? Oh my gosh, it's the, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but anyways. And so like all of a sudden in that time too though, but I, I dare feel like and say, especially given the circumstances of all that we'd been through over the like that three or four months we got to know each other, we went really slow. Like things are really casual. And it was just, I don't know, especially because I think I had had opportunities and dated and done a lot of stuff and was comfortable with myself. It felt very appropriate to just enjoy the space and time with Kent, which I also feel like personally has also what's laid the foundation for our relationship. And even when Kent, we dated for about six months. Well, one, one significant really hard thing happened after we'd been dating for about three to four months. I had a really great roommate who I, I had lived with for a year and a half. And I guess on March 31st, yeah, so it was about three or about four months later, he took his life. Um, and it was a really, really rough time, at which point too, Kent uh, was a great support. But I also had to make a decision. At this time, I was living in Pleasant Grove. Kent was living in Harriman, and anybody who knows Utah County and Salt Lake County, that was maybe a good 20, 25 minute drive from where we were at from each other. And we would just, every other night, would like spend the evening with each other. With each other. And Kent, 
at the time was living in the basement apartment of his sister's house. And so we never spent the night. It just wasn't a good situation. It wasn't a good setup to be able to stay the night together. And, um, and so we were driving back and forth constantly between Harriman and Pleasant Grove. And when my roommate took his life, um, and not that it matters, but just for the fact of it, he was actually a, he was straight, but uh, struggling a lot with alcohol. And I think when all of a sudden I was on cloud nine and a lot of big part of my life was going really easy, I think I, I missed some significant signs of what was happening in the trauma of his life. But we were past coworkers and worked in the emergency room together and I think he was dealing with a lot of stress and stuff. And that's maybe a different conversation, but it represented a, a really hard time. And it came with this decision of like, well, Kent, you want to move out and get your own apartment and actually, you know, he was working for himself and started his own business doing design and graphic work. I was working in Payson and was driving a solid 30 minutes down to Payson in Southern Utah County. And I was like, and I, but I had to make the decision within the next month if I was going to re-sign a lease and have the apartment to myself, if I get a new roommate or if I move out. And Kent and I, I was like, listen, and Kent was smart and wise in that moment where he's like, Cole, if I wasn't in the picture, what would you do? And I said, if you weren't in the picture, I would probably take this opportunity, move in with family in Spanish Fork, save money, and then try to regroup and figure out what I want to do and go someplace else. And after saying it out loud, and I'm grateful for Kent to give me that space, like we both looked at each other and I was like, oh crap, as a 34 year old or 33, however old I was, I was like, I'm gonna move home with my family again. <laughs> and uh, cause I also was like knowing that he wasn't in a space to move in and it would have been a really big adjustment. It would have been convenient had Ken just been like, you know what Cole, let's sign a lease together, I'll move in with you. But I also feel like we were at the stage where at that point currently, that was probably the longest relationship I'd got to be in at three and a half, four months. Most of my other relationships had fizzled out at things like that. And I was like, I don't know like what the future is going to hold. And it was going to be a year lease. And I was like, I don't want to do that to us. I also don't feel like we shouldn't do things just out of convenience. And so we were like, okay. So I packed up the apartment and I moved home to Spanish Fork. However, we still spent almost every night getting together. And then I would drive home to family. He would drive home to family and we would take turns going to Harriman. He had come to Spanish Fork, which is now like a 45 minute, almost an hour drive. And it was, and that's where too, I felt like things really solidified because I lived at home for about three or four months before then I moved to Salt Lake and I got a new job. And anyways, and just all throughout that time though, we didn't do things just out of convenience because we could, and it would have been really convenient. But it also, I felt like kind of laid down some solid groundwork of like independence, reliability. I'd moved to Salt Lake. Kent actually then at that point chose to get an apartment on his own. And again too, like, I don't know, I guess you can tell that story if you want. He got his own apartment. Yeah, sorry. That's, that's me passing the ball. Yeah, I, I think if there's any lessons learned on our part from all of this, it was very quickly we did realize that we were not going to make any choices out of convenience. And we said that out loud like mm -hmm. to each other because we're like, should we just move in? We've been dating three months and it's going really well. But it was just one of those things that came up where we're just like, it's not a good enough reason. And, you know, some people do, some people like... Yeah, and no judgment. That, yeah, that, you know, different people walk different paths and navigate that together. Um, for us, though, we just thought, you know, would it be convenient? Yes, but that's not a good enough reason for us. And so I got my apartment. We were kind of crisscrossing, you know, uh, the state there for a little bit. Um, and at length, did make the decision to move in. And so Cole moved in with me um, into my place. Right, and that was a full, cause that he moved into his apartment in July of 2018? I think so. Yeah, July 2018. And it wasn't until July 2019 that I actually moved in with you. And so we dated for a solid like year and a half officially dating before we decided that we're like, okay, we've proven enough time to each other and we were gonna move in together. Um, and it was a really good move. It was a really good opportunity for us to to kind of do that, I moved in with Kent, and then I, unfortunately, at that time was also looking for another job. And we knew that we were looking at different options around Salt Lake um, or Utah County, and we had some really good friends who had a townhome available. And so we, and they're like, listen, because thank goodness for good friends and relationships, they're like, we'll let you just move in, be month to month until you figure out what's gonna happen. And literally in the month we moved in in October of 2019, 
I found my job that was going to require us to move to St. George. And uh, so we moved in, lived there together for five months, and then Kent graciously agreed to move with me and follow me to St. George. Um, and so we moved down here in February 2020. And I thought if this boy has stuck with me this long <laughs> and put up with me, I was like, and we had talked about too about our relationship and where we thought about what things would go forward and where we'd like to be. Um, and so I proposed to Kent in July. He proposed back to me in October, or was that November? Uh, yeah, or was it the beginning of October? Yeah. Did you forget the first proposal? Like, why? You know, Actually, you can, you can explain yeah, that. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. People always ask us like, well, who's gonna propose? Who is gonna do that? And from the time we were dating and like getting more serious, Cole and I just made this agreement that it was like, we're a, a partnership in every sense of the word. Like if we're doing this thing for the long haul, we're, we're pulling our own weight, we're in this together, we're working together. Like, and so we just decided early on, like we're both proposing. So like someone can go first, someone's going to go first, but the other then will just respond like, and say like, great, I wanna marry you, do you wanna marry me? And I mean, you would think the whole like, marry me, yes, would be like sufficient and you know, <laughs> and it is. Did, One would assume yes. I mean, it is, but, but we wanted to my the defense chance. As well, he <laughs> said that, but I was like, that's fine, I'm gonna propose first. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm proposing first. Unless you're Patrick yeah. Swayze and just ditto works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gosh, but that was just something that in and of ourselves, we had just decided kind of early on in the relationship yeah. that like, we both wanted the chance to propose that question. And yeah, it sounds silly and superfluous to be like, well, you said yes. And yeah, I did when he proposed to me first. But I wanted the chance to also propose and, and I wanted did. him he to have the chance and he did it. to it say great. yes. and. And so we, we did, like we both just knew going in though that that's how we mm -hmm. wanted things to play out. So Cole went first and then a few months later I kind of made my own plans and proposed back. And yeah, when people ask, I think it's a similar reaction. They're just like, wait, what? <laughs> like, what? You, you already, already got engaged. Weird, but this is yeah, yeah. and so, cause we announced the first one, right? Cole proposed Do you wanna know July which one of us is gonna wear the dress? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, that's not happening. Yeah. But. And I like this topic of marriage yeah. because um, often when we talk about same gender relationships, it's um, we now this is interesting territory. We'll be together forever till we find somebody new seems to be the great mantra with same gender relationships where there's not a lot of commitment. There's, there's commitment until something changes and then it's easy to, to skirt away. But in terms of marriage, why marriage? What, what about marriage? There's, there isn't obligation to get married because of children and mm -hmm. what we would typically see in a religious or heterosexual relationship and the rearing of children where society says, oh, if you're going to get married or if you're pregnant, there should be a wedding. So if that's not in this relationship, what is so important about marriage that tells you to this is the next step? So it's funny you ask us that question because, I don't know, a couple of years ago, we, well, we had that conversation our, amongst ourselves, like early mm -hmm. on, like, why would we get married? Why wouldn't we get married? What would that look like? How would that change us? And we made it a point that every time we sat down with someone who was married, we asked the exact same question, mm -hmm. mostly out of like genuine curiosity yeah. of just what changed from the time you were dating to when you got married and why, why marriage? I think especially too, because a lot of people that's very common, especially, and I even believe it is common outside of uh, LDS culture, Mormon culture to spend time living together before you officially get married. And, uh, and so specifically, even within Utah, I believe that there's a lot of, especially same gender couples that will spend time living together before they get married. And I really wanted to know, like, if you've already been living with somebody for six months to a year, or for some of our friends, five years, why, what's the point? Why get married? If like, and what, how do you see your relationship change with going from just to somebody you're living with who you claim to be your significant other to like officially doing the vows, doing I do, getting married. 
And, uh, and I, I was actually really surprised by people's comments because I felt like for the most part, they're, where I feel like, and you can speak for yourself too and tell me if you agree, but I feel like the majority of the comments came down to knowing that there was something significant into a piece of paper that represented to be able to say my certificate of marriage is the exact same as yours, um, and that it issued a new level of acceptance for even they themselves, as much as it did to like being able to say like, we are the same. Um, it also, I think, represented just like that next level of commitment. I had some dear friends that they experienced significant trauma after they got married, and one of my good friends uh, lost her nephew to cancer, and they played a very big role in that family. And it just brought up some stresses that they were vulnerable with us by saying, if we weren't married, I don't know if we would have made it. But because we were married, it would made it would, we would have gone through X amount of more steps to then officially separate. And because we would have had to go through those many more steps we chose not to, and now we are stronger together because we had the trauma together. That marriage just meant that it was something more that just thickened the attachment of connection to make them fight through what were some of the hardest times in their life that they'd experienced yet. And those moments and like understanding that really made me realize I do want that. Do you want to, I do want to say something, but I feel like I want you to speak to what you, about it first, what you think. Yeah, I think for me, when people ask, you know, why get married and not just live together and live out your lives together, it's, to me, it just represents that I'm entering a relationship with no intention to exit. And marriage is one of many ways that represents that I'm not looking for an easy way out of this relationship. Um, I've been divorced once and I'm not looking to divorce again. And admittedly, there are times where I think, well, if I don't get married again, I won't get divorced again. Um, but at the same time, getting married is a commitment to myself that I'm gonna show up for Cole. It's a commitment that he makes to me that he's gonna show up for me and that if at length we determine we divorce or have to go our separate ways, it's one more pause before we do that to have to actually file for divorce. And that's a pause that I'm willing to take and that I plan to take if we ever arrive to that place. And so for me, marriage, among many things, at the risk of sounding you know overly kind of clinical, <laughs> is just, it's, something put into place for our relationship that would allow me and both of us to really think twice before we go to end it and to think twice before we just compromise it and for me that is a, a step that i'm willing to take if i ever forget why we got into this relationship in the first place the only thing that i would add is and i do think that i question the sanctity of marriage and obviously in my culture and how I was raised it is now for eternity it's something you reserved yourself for and I do feel like I, I don't find myself complying with that same belief system anymore that it makes me question the significance of it I think though in our foundation of Mormonism and growing up and the idea of being dads that is an aspect of something that does serve me well and the idea of getting to have a family does seem significant if that can be the case, even if it's not going to happen by any accident. It's gonna be a very thoughtful, planned, significant event in order to make that actually come to possibility. But especially in a very le legal way, we have to legally be married to adopt, to foster care. Um, I guess legally we wouldn't maybe have to if we wanted to be on the birth certificate of, you know, if we did surrogacy, surrogacy or something, but I think even then too, I don't think you, I don't know if you can have two men without being legally married on the birth certificate. So I feel like for the, also the legal act of knowing that if we choose to have a family down in the future, a marriage license is actually very significant for us. But if we had no desire to have a family and no desire to have kids, I personally don't know if I would truly care about marriage the same way that I was that I was raised in thinking about marriage. Um, but that being said, we, I mean, it's still something to kind of consider, I guess. Because, but I do think that our goals would be to be dads, 
and to be able to have a family and think that we could do it. And hopefully a significant job, you know, but like, won't be perfect. We won't claim to be perfect. From the Conference Center pulpit, James E. Faust said, your type of love is counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Your marriage would be counterfeit. That within Mormonism, this is, um, this is not an acceptable form of love. The family proclamation to the world says that marriage is only between man and a woman, that there are no uh, happy experiences on this side of marriage, that what you're doing is an abomination. How do you respond to those types of accusations? I think you, the one, you have a really good response to this. Yeah, as I divorced and counseled with you know, church leaders kind of through that process, it was just brought to me again and again and again. Kent, what about the family proclamation? Kent, what about the plan of salvation? You know, if you pursue a gay relationship, you're disqualifying yourself from all of this and you're, you know, you have to adhere to this plan essentially if you want all these promised blessings. And I finally just had to draw the line for my own health <laughs> and well-being and, you know, sanity and look across a bishop's desk and say, the family proclamation is a beautiful ideal. And for, for so many people, it plays out wonderfully. And I celebrate that. I welcome that. Many members of my family have married men and raised children in heterosexual relationships in the church and outside of the church. And they're happy. They, it doesn't mean they haven't had challenges, but like that ideal has largely come true for them. And I love it. I have nieces and nephews now. Like, I love that. Like the family proclamation in many ways is a beautiful ideal for many people. And it's simply not the extent of possibility for all of God's children. I see the family proclamation as one page in an expansive book of eternity. And that page has a place in that book. But the page of two men finding genuine joy together and raising a family, however that looks for them, is another page in that book. The page of someone who never marries and never has children is another page in that book. And the page that is a family who has a woman who is widowed and left with two children and is a single mom the rest of her life and then adopts children from somewhere else and then remarries down the road. That is another beautiful page in this book. You know, someone who fosters children and never adopts them, but is a critical role in those formative years of a child's life who's in the foster care system. Equally beautiful, equally impactful, equally significant. So I can't be convinced that a single page dictates the joy and the destiny and the opportunity for all of God's children. And that brings me a lot of peace. Um, I can respect the fact that the family proclamation as a page in a book will serve many people, but I celebrate the fact that every additional page is just as capable of bringing genuine joy and, and just hope and life to so many other families in all of their different forms. And so that's sort of where I stand with, I guess, any official statements on there is one acceptable family. It's tough to stomach that because if you look around our own congregations, you know, if you go to your you know, own ward and look around your congregation, your fam families look all different ways. And so it's, it's a little discouraging to think that we so exclusively define what a family is when it's right in front of us. Like if there was literally only one way, then why would God even permit there to be widows or orphans or any even possibility of recombining a family other than a man and a wife who are married and raise their own children? Like it's not a matter of philosophical or religious opinion that different family units exist. <laughs> Period. And so for me, it's just, it's easy to think, why, why would we be so fixed 
as a faith on limiting the definition of a family when there were, will always be beautiful iterations of family that exist in so many different ways. How have each of your families been impacted by your relationship uh, in terms of acceptance and um, support? Do I get to go first? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to answer that first by saying, by telling one other quick story, and I'm going to try to make it quick. I had had a previous boyfriend uh, who we dated for a while, and then he needed to move home and go back to Illinois. And unfortunately, when it happened, after he got home, we talked every night for a week. And then at a week's point, he just disappeared. And I completely ghosted me. And I think, and I can look back in hindsight now and recognize that I think he, in his immature way, or what I would identify as an immature way, thought it would just be better to just cut ties. And then, and while it hurt so much more up front, at least the stories I tell myself is that it, it speed in the recovery process because then I went, got really bitter um, and it's amazing when you are in a really emotional upsetting way that way like I was ready to like purchase a ticket and be like fly to his house because I had his address to be like WTF dude like what's what are you doing um, but I didn't and um, but I remember a couple weeks goes by and I um, I couldn't tell my family and my mother with all of her mother senses all of a sudden corners me one day and she goes, what's going on? And she had known I'd been dating this guy, uh, though I wasn't really allowed to talk about it and I couldn't have him over and, I, and there was a bunch of things going on too. And it was a really rougher time when things were not as great communication wise with my parents. But my mom grabbed me and she goes, what is going on? And I just looked at her and I said, he's ignored me, he's ghosted me. And I said, he's not responded to me and he's gone. And my mother just looked at me and she's like, no. No, and she just started sobbing. And to see her cry, and I felt like, and I knew, she knew how bad I was hurting. I cried, and I think I just absolutely broke down, and she just hugged me. And I think that was an extremely triggering moment for my mother to recognize love in the way that all of a sudden I was, that she wanted me to be happy and to have somebody who I could love, and that has really hurt. And I feel like it was the first time that she recognized real heartache and realized this is the same for him if, as if it was a girl that did this to him. So you were, I think, I mean, probably a year or so goes by when I met Kent. And uh, I think he was my next boyfriend. And, and uh, granted, we didn't introduce him to my family for, I think, five, or five months or so. I guess it was that Mother's Day or in May. My sister invited you over. And, um, but when he started coming around, my family was extremely receptive for the first time ever. And I even jokingly say they now love him so much that it's like almost too easy. Cause I'm like, wait, this, for all the other years of the hardship, this should be a little bit more hard. <laughs> but they, I mean, but I mean, look at him and his beautiful smile and dark eye. <laughs> He's amazing. And so I feel like, uh, my family loves him. And as we've got to live in St. George's last year and have family come stay with us, and now we're the place that all my siblings and their families love to come and stay, and they fight whoever gets to be the family to be with us and to understand and know how they accept Kent, accept our relationship, and are thoroughly excited for our wedding in September. Like, I confess, I didn't, I didn't ever think this was gonna be possible and I find myself in an extremely fortunate situation. Yeah, I have a really supportive and amazing family as well. When I ended the first marriage, the hard part was not coming out and telling them I was gay. The harder part was just the loss of a daughter-in-law. Um, I have all sisters, I have six sisters, and so she was the only daughter-in-law in, in our family. And so, you know, that was a, a tough loss. Um, and I, my family is still in touch with her and I welcome that interaction and it's, it's great, but um, that was harder than me coming out. And so as far as accepting me and, and the, the truth that I had, you know, shared with them and, and coming out at that point, they were, they were wonderful and supportive, but I was still navigating so much at that point that I remember the day I sent the email and kind of explained all of this about divorcing and being gay to my family. 
my little sister came over to my parents' house where I was staying at the time and she just kind of ran up to me and crying and grabbed me in a hug and she's just like, I, I didn't know and I'm sorry and I am here now and I just can't imagine what would have happened if we like lost you or if you know you took your life and all these things and I remember we just like sat down on the sofa in my parents' house and she's like, you were just gonna be the best dad. And somehow that struck me because I just thought, I came out and I just ended a marriage. Like I'm never going to be a dad. Like I'm, I'm not going to remarry. I'm not gonna have a future like with anyone. Like I'll never date again. I'll never marry again. I'll certainly never be a father. But it like hadn't crossed her mind that that wasn't a possibility for me. And I, I couldn't really believe that in the moment. I just thought, oh my gosh, she thinks I could be a dad? Like she thinks I have a future? Like that I could marry someday and like have a family? Like, wait a minute. And I've never forgotten that. And then another sister, my one of my older sisters, you know, months after coming out, you know, and she contacted me and said, hey, I, I'm in charge of my book club this month and we're reading a book about the LGBTQ community because we have to have that conversation and these people are in my ward and it's a group of women in my ward in the Relief Society and I picked the book and we're reading it and we're going to talk about it because we need to have these discussions in, in settings like this and I just thought, wait, what? Like you're a very, you're, you're a devout practicing member of the church and you're introducing this conversation to people in your ward, like, and holding this dialogue. And this just, you know, every member of my family in different ways kind of showed up to, to express that support in their own way and continue to express that. And so by the time I started dating and bringing Cole around, it was just, they just welcomed him immediately. And it, I don't say that lightly because I know for so many families that is a, a hard thing like that's a privilege based on who my family is mm -hmm. that I've been blessed to enjoy and I know that is not the case for everyone it's not a, a quick thing it's not a, a an easy thing for many family dynamics to accept but I am grateful every day that my family is who they are and that accepting Cole and accepting me for loving Cole was something that came easily to them and so grateful to Cole's family for making room for me in their life. The one thing that I think stands out as Cole and I have navigated this with both our families over the last few years is that there are times I know for my family, I know for Cole's family, where I expect there are moments where they've probably thought, you know, gosh, we don't really know exactly what to make of this, or we don't really know exactly how this aligns with what we believe or with the church that we're members of. Um, and not because they said anything, but just, you know, I, I've been in that space. <laughs> I've asked the same questions. And, and uh, the one thing that just always comes to mind is I just think, you know, even if they have questions, even if they have concerns or fears around having, you know, their son and brother marry another man, their actions have always spoken so much louder than their words in the best possible way. Because even if they have those concerns, even if they have fears around it, they just default to acts of kindness. Kent, come to the family barbecue. Come camping. Just, just come over and we'll figure out our feelings, however we need to figure them out, but just be part of our family in the meantime. And that, you know, has always been how I've been made to feel. And not right out of the gate, but I would say pretty quickly after being introduced to Cole's family. Yeah. There were still things we navigated that were tricky. If we go on trips as a family, like what limits are there that we respect yeah. the family or preferences, like, you know what I mean? But they never did anything that made me feel unwelcome or that made me feel like they were not going to just default to love and acceptance, even if they had their own doubts or fears around what was happening. There were some feelings that I'd had at one point because my siblings even again i'm now i mean i'm i'm now 36 going to be pushing 37 and so within the last three and a half years i might and i'd been out for a now close to seven years and since the time that i came out and i think i'd gone to my first affirmation conference 
before officially telling my parents, or maybe it was that same month, because I think it's typically in September. Um, anyways, that I had gone to it, and I remember telling when like the discussion was happening, and anytime that my siblings would finally like open up and ask me some questions, I'd be like, "You need to tell your kids," and they're like, "No, we're not telling our kids." And as it went on for years, I remember too just being like, "Listen." And I drew a line in my mind where I was like, I'm no longer gonna let my family dictate what form of authenticity or how I shield my life. And I did kind of say at different times, probably with a little bit more anger and said, you know, if I do have the privilege and the opportunity to find somebody that I love and I choose to marry this person, it's on you. If your kids are like, wait a second, what? Uncle Colbert is gonna marry a boy? Like, and then have to dictate what that means. And from my siblings' perspective, they were trying, they're trying to protect, they're trying to shield their kids because they feel like they need to have some form of understanding first before they can just tell them what this means. And I told them in many instances why that's very inappropriate <laughs> and said, listen, I understand and I'm not saying that you have to tell your children how wrong I am. You are allowed to say in our home, we are going to teach and believe that marriage is between a man and a woman but we know that that doesn't fit for all people or even within our belief system, we're out of our belief system. Uncle Colbert happens to be somebody who he really feels like he's gonna be most happy with a boy the same way that your mom and dad are, are happy. And I said, I promise you, kids just knowing that, when they have questions and you open that dialogue, they will then come to you and ask questions. Instead of this idea of, well, why is Uncle Colbert bringing that same dude around? <laughs> His and, roommate. Yeah, his roommate. And there had been a few moments, and a pretty funny one. I even think, was it last summer, or was it the summer before? Because I feel like it was only a year ago. Uh, Kent had come over for a family barbecue. Now today, especially when we announced our engagement, I do know that all of my siblings have told all my nieces or nephews or my nibblings um, that, they, that, that Kent and I are engaged, that we're in a relationship, that we love each other. And... Um, but anyways, but before I'd had one nephew, a little nephew that did not officially know that we were in a relationship. And Kent was over at our house. My parents have a little above, graze, above ground raised pool. And I must have jumped up for a second and Kent was in the pool. Do you want to tell him what, what he oh, asked yeah. him Oh yeah, his little like eight year old nephew just looked at me and was like, so you and my uncle Cole just get along really, really well, huh? You just, you just must like him an awful lot. And I was like, you know what? I do. And did you see something I like, really aren't do. you guys like, are you guys like best friends? Yeah, something like to that effect. And I was like, he gets it. You know, he might not have like specific words for it, but like, I think he gets so it. So my first sister calls me one day and says, I have to let you know. I officially, she was the first sibling to officially tell her kids that her uncle, that uncle Colbert is gay. And uh, I says, what did, how did it go? And she goes, well, she goes, we were coming home from church and her oldest daughter at this time, I think was 13, 14. And Summer, being the good Mormon mom, is like, hey kids, how was church? How was your lessons today? And she's got four girls and her husband's in the seat and Summer was driving. And apparently, they're like, you know, the older kids kind of shrugged it. And so Summer, being the good intuitive mother, is like, oh no, what was, tell me about Sunday school. And McKenna's like, eh, I didn't like my lesson, so I walked out. And Summer's like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? So apparently they had gotten home and sat down. She goes, let's have a discussion. She goes, um, why did you walk out of your Sunday school lesson? And Kenna's like, I don't know, I just, I just didn't really like it. And she goes, well, what was, what was the lesson on? And McKenna, my oldest niece, she's just like, well, it was on the proclamation of the family. And Summer's like, what don't you like about the proclamation of the family? She's like, oh, I don't know. And like, she's being kind of dismissive, but eventually she said, she goes, well, our teacher was just saying that marriage is only between man and a woman, and I just don't know if I think that that's correct. And again, she's like 14 years old. And Summer's like, do you, do you know anybody that's gay? And apparently Summer, my sister, explained that the 14-year-old girl shot eyes directly with the next girl, who I think, I think, say, was like 11 at this time. And then they heard and both looked down. And Summer's like, uh, and she's like, wait, do you? do you guys know somebody who's gay? And Kenna's like, mom, don't, don't let me say it. Cause she's looking at her other littler siblings, uh, who I think at that time was probably like eight or nine and then like four or five. And Summer's like, no, Kenna, it's okay. You can tell me, who do you think is gay? And apparently uh, the two oldest looked at each other and they go, well, we think Uncle Colbert and Kent are gay. And uh, apparently, and God love her, the, little, the third one's like, uh-uh, they're just really good friends. <laughs> and Summer goes, no, you're correct. Cole and Kent are gay. 
And she goes, and they have a great relationship. And Sayla's like, I knew it. And they like start like kind of laughing. And Summer goes, you're right. They are. And they love each other. And that's okay. And anyways, and from that point, my sister became my biggest advocate and told all my other siblings why they needed to tell their kids. Um, and then it did trickle down and eventually they all did. I do want to share one other experience that feels kind of significant that I feel like was a really important thing now and would be my advice to anybody who has a child who is gay that is curious or, or lesbian or transgender or whatever it may be, who is questioning what their relationship will look like. I remember very uncomfortably when my parents, because when I did have uh, did the discussion about Fisher being gay, it didn't end well. My parents were like, we need to talk. And I was like, great, we can talk if we go to a public space. <laughs> so we went to good old Cafe Rio, got a salad, and my dad passes me this talk by Jeffrey R. Holland that says overcoming homosexual activity. And I was like, yeah, I read this talk five years ago. And I- 15 times. Yeah, I was like, um, I know exactly what it says. Like, I've read all these talks. You know, so my dad's like, well, you, he's like, you can't ever bring anybody over to our house. You can never, um, you know, they won't be accepted in our house. And I, we don't want any of the grandkids to know. And it was a really uncomfortable talk and I'm grateful that things have come full circle. But there was a moment, and it is hard to explain because, but I will try to very, if ever there was a moment that I ever identified the spirit, I feel like this is one of those moments because I felt a very calmness in my chest. But I remember specifically looking at my parents and said, do you love me? And my mom's like, of course we love you. We love you so much. I says, do you think I'm a good person? Of course, Cole, you're a great person. And I said, then I want you just to think again for a second what you're saying. Because if by that same thinking that you are so afraid who I bring over will somehow infect the nieces and nephews, will be so detrimental or ruin our family, if whoever I get to date one day, by that same reasoning, they will never get to know me. They will never know who I am, who I, what I like, and will never know the good person that you think I am because they won't let them bring their boyfriend around. And I will say in like in a very nice moment, it felt kind of like a nothing but net moment in basketball. Cause then I was just like, I don't know where else the argument is. And it did, it took years. And I'm so grateful to report that we've come a long ways and that they love Kent so much. But it felt very significant and it was just that moment, if you love your children, by your same defense of trying to protect the family from this relationship, you are also denying somebody else the opportunity to get to know your son or your child. And the reasoning just doesn't work. Excellent experience, like just understandable. Um, I think as a final question, after, under, after listening to the story and listening to your experience, my final question would be, was it worth it? Was it worth the coming out, the pressure, the ridicule, the questionable thoughts and actions of family members? Was it all worth it to do all that for this relationship? Sarcastic answer first. Go for it. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, but don't, don't get emotional. You can live what might feel like a safe life in the closet. Um, and at some point you might get brave enough to open the door of that closet and come out, you know, by our common term. What I didn't realize was that opening this metaphorical closet door had a lot less to do with me leaving the closet and a lot more to do with me opening a door and allowing people in. Um, yes, by most commonly understood terms, I came out from a space that was dark and unhealthy and difficult, but I didn't arrive to a new place by some magic or some relocation. I, I was stayed where I was, but my door was now open and while very few people might have put distance between me after, you know, I shared who I was, you know, more authentically, most people showed up for me. And most significantly, I opened that door of my closet to let people in and it let Cole in and it let Cole's family in to my life. 
And even beyond that, it let countless numbers of people enter my life who were just waiting to offer support. Paul and Susie Augenstein, who hosted that barbecue where we met, are two among so many people who were waiting to enter my life when I opened the door of my closet. And I got lucky enough that I met someone who has helped guide me through some really difficult and insecure paths that I've had to navigate in my adult life since coming out. But it was absolutely worth opening the door of my closet so that Cole could enter my life and his family could enter my life. And it's, it's almost hard to say like, yes, it's, it's just worth it and just, just endure it and go for it. Like, I'm lucky. Cole and I are lucky. It is, it is not that easy for a lot of people. Like, it can cost you the family you know and love. It can cost you the only family you know. Like, I, I see that hard reality around me. And I will be the first to acknowledge that Cole and I are so lucky to sit here and say, it was worth it because it didn't cost us that much. And that's a huge blessing and a huge privilege. So for me to say it was worth it is, is relatively simple because it just didn't cost us what I know it costs so many people. But I will say if you're in the closet and you're terrified of coming out because you're afraid of what it could cost you, it's important to realize that while it may cost you some, it will also allow you to gain so much. And the hard part is you don't know what you have to gain, mm -hmm. truthfully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can look at people like Cole and I and say, well, they found each other and they have supportive families and it all works out. It can, it's not a guarantee. And mm -hmm. I would love to sit here and say like, once you yeah. come out, you have everything to look forward to. I believe the optimist that I am that you do. Mm -hmm. But I also realize like, it might get harder. It might be tough. You might be single, but if coming out or going through all this puts you in a better and healthier space, I expect that if it's something that you really want, that you will find someone in the right time and the right place and, and that it can work out. I'm, I'm a bit romantic. I'm a bit idealistic, <laughs> but like, I, I think that if you're afraid to come out because of what it could cost you, it's important to remember what you also have to gain, mm -hmm. whether that's a, a spouse or whether that's just friends or allies or people who become your chosen family. Um, it does make it worth it when you realize how very much you have to gain. It's mm -hmm. great advice. The only thing I would add, because I obviously of course agree, and I'm grateful to stand where I am today and to say that I'm very optimistic towards our future. But I also feel like sometimes these things, and something I said in my last um, a podcast was this idea of the vulnerability is also writing your story before the ending is decided. I do feel like we know that Kent and I, the advantage of being in a great relationship and having the communication that we do is that we also know our flaws. Um, Kent and I are very different people. He's clearly the extrovert, I'm clearly the introvert. But I feel like, but we also like, we know our differences. I believe we play to our strengths and that's an ideal situation. But there's also a lot of things that we get to work through. And I would love to be able to stand here and be like, oh, we just know we're gonna spend the whole rest of our life together. And no, we don't ever, you don't ever get into a relationship to know that it's going to end. And I pray that it doesn't. And I'm grateful because if there's anything that I've learned so far is that what we have is something worth fighting for. And I think specifically in getting married, like we are gonna continue that fight and the idea that we are gonna serve each other. But I also will not be naive to say, oh, that we're gonna be perfect. Cause I know we have a lot of struggles and there's gonna be a lot of things we get to work through. Um, but I feel like I also am extremely comfortable confessing the fact that if there's anybody I imagine in my life doing it with, it's Kent. And that feels really good. It doesn't feel counterfeit to me. It doesn't. Thank you. And I think that's probably the best way to end that. Yeah. Thank you, both of you, for sharing Thank your you, story and experience again. Yeah. <laughs> in just a little bit different light. Because I, uh, I think your experience and, and what you've shared today uh, can be an opportunity for those who are navigating this water to see that there is uh, a happy experience. There, is, there can be light at the end of the tunnel with or yeah. without those rainbow slippers. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, that you can make that path um, 
a little easier for, for someone to, to cross and maybe even so. ease a few minds of mothers out there who worry for their gay children who sure. navigate this journey. Yeah. Again, thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for having us. Again, we want to thank these guys for sharing their story and, and hope that you uh, felt inspired by the message as well. If you do have a question for Kent or Cole and want to uh, leave that for them or even a comment and you're on our video version through Facebook or YouTube, we invite you to share that below. We also invite you to share this episode if it meant something to you or if you know someone who could benefit from their message. We invite you to click the share button and send that away. Again, the Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to better understand the intersection of sexuality and reality where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Again, we thank you for giving us a little bit of your time to better understand these experiences and know that it's stories just like this that help us to continue writing our Latter Gay Stories. Close my eyes and I can see the world that's waiting up for me that I call my own. Through the dark, through the door, through where no one's been before, but it feels like home. They can say, they can say it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say I've lost my mind. I don't care, I don't care, so call me crazy. We can live in a world that we design. Cause every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. I think of what the world could be, a vision of the one I see. A million dreams is all it's gonna take. A million dreams for the world we're gonna make There's a house we can build Every room inside is filled With things from far away The special things I compile Each one there to make you smile They can say, they can say it all sounds crazy They can say, they can say we've lost our minds I don't care, I don't care if they call us crazy Run away to a world that we desire